would like to engage you in a journey that will start with nutrition. We will talk a little bit about uh, evolutionary biology and we will finish with biomedical applications and all around taste and the meaning of taste. Have you ever thought, why do we taste? What's the meaning of taste? I'm going to give you two answers to start. The first answer is about the quality of foods. If you think about sweet, sweet taste, we have developed sweet taste to sense carbohydrates in the diet, simple sugars, good source of energy, energy being an essential nutrient. There's another taste type that has evolved related to energy, and that's fatty taste. But that, but that fatty taste is about the lipid part of the diet. Right? There's a third very important nutrient in our diets, and that's proteins. And if you ever heard about umami taste, umami being related to glutamate, savory taste, other amino acids too. So in fact, umami is related to the protein part of the diet. So see, we have carbohydrates, we have proteins, we have lipids, and they are all related to one of these three taste types. So, in fact, what we could say is that or our oral cavity is a fantastic food analytical lab. And our tongue is a probe capable of taking samples from the food that we're chewing and conveying to our brain information about the quality of the food we're, we're eating so that we make decisions whether we like that food, we want, we want more, we crave for food, or we may want to avoid food. And my talk is more about avoidance, if anything else. So that's my second answer regarding what taste means. And the second is about the defense mechanism against some potential toxic compounds. Right? And I'm going to talk to you about the tomato as a good example. One of the strategies that plants have to deter us from, from predating plants is color. Right? So, in fact, if I ask you how many tomatoes did you see in my previous slide? I would expect that some of you would say one or two. One or two. Yeah. Three, four. Three, four, majority. Good observers. Good. You've been well trained by tomatoes. That's exactly what the tomato wanted you to see, right? Because, in fact, there's eight tomatoes. Only three that want to be seen, the ones that are ripened. Red, fleshy. And succulent, too, they have uh, in their flesh, they have a lot of uh, glutamic, so they are, uh, they are really, really tasty. Now, but I'm maybe more interested in the green tomatoes. Green tomatoes are not ripe, and they, their seeds are not really ready to be disseminated. That's why they don't want to be eaten, right? So they're hiding away. They are not liberating any flavor. In fact, in their flesh, we will find it rich in one compound that we call tomatin. And tomatine is not a friendly compound. It's quite toxic. So those of you who ever thought about eating a green, unripened tomato, I wouldn't do it. Because it's not going to give you anything good. So now, in order to prevent us from doing silly things like this, we have developed bitter taste. Because this compound is terribly bitter. right? So we're not even close to eating it. Right? So what is about, about bitter taste is about developing this defense against compounds that plants themselves have created. But these toxic compounds eventually could also be toxic to the plants themselves. They are not easy to handle. So some clever plants have actually developed compounds which are bitter to us, but they are non-toxic. They are trying to fool us. Right? Again, the plants are the ones choosing when to be eaten, right? So, what actually happens is that plants win, but don't underestimate ourselves because we have developed another strategy and a counter strategy so that we actually, in front of a novel plant or plant food, we have that almost unstoppable desire to actually try it. Maybe you have all experience. You go to a different country, you offer a food that you had never seen before. You're sort of cautious, take a step back, but there's that desire to, mm, I should try, and we actually do, we try. And that's really in our genes, that try, very little amount, unlikely they will kill us, 
but we might actually discover some nice foods to thrive through, right? So I guess all this strategy, strategy about uh, avoiding uh, toxic compounds, bitter in itself, assumes that we are all tasting bitter more or less the same. And I guess that's one of the questions that we're trying to answer today. Are we tasting all bitterness the same? And the answer is simply no. I think you've been handled some paper strips and so on. Now, I would imagine that approximately 50% of you guys would be probably classifying for excellent tasters, what we call hyper tasters, super tasters, right? High sensitivity to a compound, prop, which is actually uh, part of a chemical compound which is very common in some plant foods. Plant foods such as broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Broccoli and Brussels sprouts to some of you would probably be quite bitter, the super tasters. But for the rest of us, I'm not a super taster. This does, they just don't taste bitter at all. So if you want to find out, and if you don't know and you want to find out, whether you're a super taster or not, that little piece of your genome is in your hands. It's that paper strip, and the way you do it, you just put it on top of your tongue, and then you chew it gently, wait a few seconds, and immediately I start to see some faces for super tasters. Congratulations, you're a super taster. And you'll see some, some faces saying, oh, this is so bitter, right? I know, I see, sorry about that. that that's why you have the lolly, <laughs> right? <laughs> And then I see all the faces like, what am I supposed to taste, right? Welcome to the non-taster world. We're <laughs> non-taster. <laughs> so, all right. So we know now who's super taster and who's not. And that was a lot of fun for some, for the non-tasters. But what is that all about? Here's my question. Is that all, all for fun? And for the next 10 minutes, that's what I'm going to try to answer. Is that meaning something, being super taster or a non-taster? And that hopefully will be answered over the next five to ten minutes. Now, there's a, some background that I need to give you before I answer the question. Number one is very unique uh, complexity of bitter taste. I, I, I said before, I mentioned about energy being an essential nutrient, um, sweet taste helping us identify some of these energy sources. That's only three genes, this, not disappointingly. Three genes, enough. We know what carbohydrates are in the diet, all good. Now, when we talk about bitterness, it's not three genes, not even six, not even 12, 25. We have 25 bitter genes. If that's telling us something, it tells us, hey, that's a good chunk of my genome. What are you doing with it, right? And what we do with it is something really important for our survivability, obviously, right? So I'm going to tell you the story by mentioning a research that I was involved. And it took around 100 individual pig genomes that we had access to. Those pigs were part of populations scattered all over the globe. Some of these populations were isolated in remote areas. They had not been mixed with other populations at all for centuries, right? So a very good model to study what drives, because Maybe some of you already know that this animal species, the, the pig, was originated in that part of the world, in the Pacific Rim, right? We don't know exactly where, but certainly Pacific Rim. And then they traveled through, um, they migrated westbound towards Europe. They took it easy, took them three million years to get there, right? <laughs> they were not fast, right? But, but now, the relevant thing about our research is that we could track back what genes were actually important to adapt to the new environments. And guess what? It's not about sweet sensing genes. Mm -mm, they were all the same. Umami? Mm -mm, no, all the same. Fatty? No way. It was all about beta. We found a high number of mutations that were conserved across all these different individuals that could almost track back their path through to Europe, right? Meaning that, obviously, the adaptability of the beta taste system was fundamental to adapt to new foods, new beta compounds, toxic compounds, and so on. 
And we believe that that has also happened in human beings since we migrated from Africa. Right? So there's another thing that I want to share with you regarding uniqueness of bitter taste. I call that the transitioning. You see, sweet, umami, fatty, they, they are all hardwired. Good hedonic value, we love them no matter what. Young, old, but bitter, if anything, innately, we try to avoid bitterness. There's not one thing, single child that enjoys bitterness in young ages. So it's all about learning. We learn to like bitter, right? Because I'm sure that all of you have a favorite bitter food, right? Who likes coffee or tea? There you go. Who likes chocolate? Right? Dark chocolate, no, bitter chocolate. Beer, wine, there's other effects obviously there, but you know, they're also bitter, right? So we, you know, sort of um, learn how to um, be attracted to some bitterness. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example, a domestic one. Um, any of you have dogs at home? Yeah, a number of you. I'm sure you have experienced the same I have with our dogs. Every now and then, they just run to the backyard and found these, some grasses out there. They start bend, bend, eating those grasses like crazy. So what are they doing until they eventually they regurgitate, they vomit. So apparently what they're doing is they had eaten something before that was not quite the right thing. And then actually bitterness, one of the things, excessive bitterness, what it does is it actually provokes vomiting, right? So that's what they do and they feel better. And that's the concept. So at some point we're traveling, we're transitioning, right? From poisons to actually something that's helping us right through and makes us feel better, right? So really that transition, that learning has to be linked to a reward. So why do we like the bitter foods we like? Are they giving us a reward? Think about coffee and chocolate. Mm, yeah, right? Invigorating, you know, wake us up in the morning, keeps us going. Yes. Think about um, tannins. Tannins are, uh, we, wine is rich in tannins, it's quite bitter, but it's also a very powerful antioxidant. So we think that these tannins are actually quite good in keeping oxidation in our bodies, right? Um, spices, essential oils, some of those we use cooking. Some of them are terribly bitter, but they are also very good antimicrobials, right? We use them to preserve foods and so on, right? So there's, there's actually, always a reward, if you want, related to these foods. And now that I'm talking about antimicrobials, we could talk about medicines, drugs, antibiotics, any medicine that you can think of. Do you have any medicine that tastes sweet and umami, unless you put something else? They all, they all taste bitter, bitter pills, right? And that's the conundrum. That's the conundrum about bitter taste. Are they poisons or are they medicines, right? So, in fact, that's where science is, is progressing. We're trying to understand a bit better the healthy side of bitter foods. Right? Now, the most fascinating finding on bitter taste over the last 15 years, in fact, has nothing to do about taste. It has to do with these little taste sensory cells that we discovered on the tongue. But now these same cells, exactly the same cells, are present all along the GI tract, stomach, intestine, small, large, right? What do they do there? They don't taste there, right? Unless you do, let me know, because then we're gonna start a new research project. <laughs> what they do, in fact, is talk to the brain and tell them, look, we have enough goodies, maybe it's time to start satiating and start stopping eating. But that's not the end of the story. Those same cells are also present in the respiratory system, in the lungs, in the bronchia. Right? What do they do there? Scientists have found two different uh, functions there. One relates to detecting, in fact, some infections. There happens to be that some bacteria release compounds that are bitter. And we can sense them. At least if you're a super taster, you, you're in good shape. Because you're going to be able to detect those infections before us, the ones we're not tasting. And in fact, you, what happens is that you activate the immune system against those bacteria, get rid of those bacteria. Now, staying still in the lungs, there's another function that bitter compounds have seen bronchodilating, uh, just uh, 
relaxing the smooth muscle of the lungs. Right? As we were inhaling, which the four pharmaceutical industries are looking as a potential treatment for asthma. Right? And that's my last uh, um, biomedical application of bitter taste, and is probably the most fascinating. And that was discovered right here at UQ. It was a research collaboration between the School of Biomedical Sciences and my institute, Coffee. We discovered a network of these sensory cells in the cardiovascular system, the heart, in the vessels, and there were a number of different functions that we observed, but probably the most amazing, the most promising one, was lowering blood pressure. Right? Interesting. So I'm going to finish up, and I'm going to wrap up um, by saying we've finished the, this little journey, just starting with poisonous bitterness, and we finish by talking about some actually healthy outcomes of bitter compounds, whether it's in appetite or it's preventing asthma, infections, cardiovascular diseases. Huh? So I guess the, the diet, one of the best or the better or the bitter kept secrets of diet, huh? <laughs> it's actually bitterness itself. So if I can recommend something here, if you allow me to, just, just indulge in your favorite bitter foods because there might be some healthy outcomes there. Thank you so much.